Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Princess Tara Zamani and today I will be presenting my senior thesis. So over the last year I've been working under the guidance of Dr. Neil Cotter and my project was an FPGA implementation of a linear spiking response model neural network. So let's get started. I'd like to begin by addressing why do this research, right? What is the purpose? And the inspiration behind it really comes down to one thing, the human brain. You know, ultimately our goal is to be able to recreate this just because the brain is so ideal in its functionality and power efficiency, um, but that's a pretty big task. So we believe in order to start that, you have to understand its basic functionality. So that's why we focused in on spiking neural networks instead of ANNs because it's more biologically plausible. SNNs allow us to step into the details and they provide a variety of opportunities um, first of which is replicating the brain's behavior. It, that has multiple benefits behind it. First, it helps us further understand the human brain, right? Once you have a model set up, replicating the basic structure, you can use it to explore how those structures interact and learn new things about it, which is what we did in our research. Um, in addition, there's the machine learning aspect, which is a hot topic. You know, ANNs have been quite successful within the last decade with speech recognition and you know, self-driving cars and everything, but when you consider how the model actually works, um, you know, by averaging all the spiking behavior as the inputs, it really blurs out a lot of the details that the actual brain is using. So SNNs allow us to step back into that. SNNs also give an opportunity for power efficiency. You know, the golden standard, again, the human brain, it only uses 20 watts of power for all of the computations it does. So going back to how it works gives us the opportunity to um, really capitalize on that and use SNNs to do that. So when we're replicating the brain, right, you have to start with its basic structure, which is the biological neuron. So just a really brief overview. Um, how a neuron works is there's various spikes that come in electrical pulses on the input branches and in the soma if the summation of the spikes is larger than an internal voltage threshold, then a neuron fires its own spike that travels down the axon. The synapse introduces its own new weights, and then it's propagated on to the next neuron. Now stepping into our linear mathematical spiking response model. So on the picture on the left, you can see the different spikes coming in, like in the previous neuron. Um, those all have different amplitudes and are at slightly different times. I know it's a little hard to tell in the picture, but they come in and they get accumulated. The same behavior occurs. Within our model specifically, we have made this a linear system so that we simplify the synapses to linear triangles. And this is a bit different than other SNN models that have been used in industry. Those usually shoot straight up and then have a decay time that decays exponentially afterwards. But that doesn't that kind of gets rid of any rising time that is in the model. So having triangles allows us to maintain that rising time, which gives us more information during our calculations. In addition, I'd also like to emphasize that this really makes it super nice for events-driven spiking neural networks because you know you don't have to do processing with every small time step. You know, once you're at the base of this neuron, you know that the next event is happening. In our case, one time unit away when this synapse transitions to from the positive to the negative slope and then one time unit away again when it goes back to zero. So for event driven purposes, super simplifies things. We could just jump forward to the next event time. The black line on the right is the accumulation of all the triangles. Um, you can see that's also linear and as soon as it passes threshold, then we get the orange line, which is the firing time at time tau. So now the actual FPGA design. So I split my design up into two main components, the singular neuron core and then the overall network. So as a single ne neuron core, I kind of walk through the steps really quickly. Delays get added to shift the synaptic event times. Um, I'm assuming for this example that the first event was already processed so you can actually see some activity. So first thing we find the next event time, which is finding the minimum of all the event times, and we can see that is the blue line over here. And then following that, we update the state associated with that blue synapse. In this case, it would still be zero because it hasn't actually started going yet. So 
or at this moment in time. We calculate the slope associated with the synapses that are active, and we can see the black line. This will ultimately follow the black line, and in this case, we're rising up with the green. The current activity is then calculated based on the event time. It's kind of extrapolated forward. And then there's a comparison with the threshold to see if the current activity passed the threshold. And if it did, then we go back and calculate the exact firing time. And in this case, it didn't. But, you know, in some other cases, for example, in this one, at some point, we ultimately get to an event where it did. And then we go back and can calculate that exact firing time at time tau and output that for the rest of the network. Another important aspect was our numbering format. This is standard across the entire design. We use 16-bit fixed point values where the top three bits are the integer and the rest is the mantissa, which gives us pretty good precision, which is important for spiking times. This does limit our range of weights and delays that we can achieve up to you know, an integer value of seven. But for our application, this doesn't be, end up being a issue at all. For the full network design, in order to do our application of phase tracking, which I'll get into in a little bit, we used two neurons. A first one is a clock neuron, which just produces a steady signal at a steady time difference. And then the second one is the phase tracking neuron, which will adjust its time based on its internal characteristics. An important thing to note is, you know, there's some external synapses coming in that are attached to all of the inputs. Um, those weren't necessary to hook up for this application, but they are, the functionality is there. Also, the go signal is important, which I will get into on the next slide. So within the network, Right, one of the, our main concerns is neuron synchronization, right? You have these two neurons that are now processing events at different times, at different rates and updating. So how do you get them all to align with their multi-neuron processing? And our solution to that was by dividing the processing into what we call time epochs. And you can see in the diagram, you know, all the neurons start out as being done and then they start doing their processing and they may finish you know, one time epoch, which is one time unit in this case, at different times. And then once all of them go high again, then the go signal is generated one more time, and then they start processing again. Within the end of the epoch as well, I should note that one is subtracted from all of the firing times, and that, that also solves our, you know, rep number representation issue because all of our values will never be larger than this one time epoch. I had previously mentioned the application that our network is applied to, so now I'll get a little bit more into that. We applied it to do phase tracking in recurrent SNNs. And you know, one of the main questions we ask is how do these neurons interact with each other? And this is a great way to kind of explore that. Through some of the previous tools that were developed by myself, Dr. Cotter and Fatima, we were able to look at these networks with a really simple model and achieve phase tracking just by changing the internal characteristics specifically of the phase locking neuron. So this is actually pretty novel in the academic realm in terms of us being able to do this with such a simple network. It has been done before but usually with pretty complex mathematics that require some sort of like special case to get it to work. So the fact that we could do this it was really cool. There's three types of behaviors that can be observed. The stable behavior, which is when you know the phase locking converges to a stable value. There's an unstable behavior, in which case the firing times keep getting further away each other and the network dies down. Or there's chaotic behavior, in which the time change pretty much produces random values. And I'll get into the results. So the first one, the stable behavior, the top graph is from a research paper that we just published recently. This is from the simulation of the network. The bottom graph is from the actual FPGA results in those firing times. I also attached a video of the 
two neurons. The one on the right is the clock neuron and the one on the left is the phase tracking. Sometimes there is a bit of aliasing. Um, so if you see those kind of like dark, how the video goes dark a little bit, um, that's the blue neuron firing. And you can see it kind of went into a stable pattern. The next one is unstable behavior. You can see in the simulation graph, after a few spikes, it just dies down. Same thing happens in the FPGA model. Um, it is inverted a little bit, which if I'm being honest, I, we're still kind of analyzing why that is. My hunch is that it's because they started at different firing times, which caused a little bit of differences. But within the demo, hopefully there's no aliasing in this one. Um, you can kind of see that after a first glimpse, let me maybe try to play it again. The neuron's firing and then just the red one continues to fire, whereas the blue one dies down. Lastly, we have chaotic behavior. Once again, simulation versus FPGA results. This one's also inverted, probably for the same reasons. And let's play the video for that one. There may look like there's some patterns happening in the graph. However, I did go over the actual data associated with it and they are actually different values, which was really cool. And yeah, you can see in the video that some of the intervals between them are shorter, whereas some of them end up being longer. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me either through any of the links provided um, or at the Technical Open House. So I hope to see you guys there. Thank you.